Hello, hello, mama friends. Welcome back to another amazing episode of the Mama Work It podcast. I'm so glad you're here. If you are new around here, my name is Marissa Lonick. I am the founder of Mama Work It, where we support women in the juggle of work life, mom life, wife life, fill in the blank life. And I am your host. I am also a working mama of four kiddos, and I am so excited to be chatting with our guest today because we are talking about all things emotional eating and how our hormones can have a huge effect on what and how much we are eating. So Sherry Chabon, an osteopath and anti-diet health and life coach from Montreal, Canada, is here with us with over 23 years of experience in the fitness industry. Sherry is a renowned expert in the most challenging weight loss cases and has helped thousands of people worldwide transform their health and fitness using her revolutionary method to rewire the brain, really self-sabotaging, limiting beliefs and patterns, and fall in love with fitness so that weight loss becomes easy, predictable, and enjoyable. Yes, please. That sounds like a great lifestyle that I would love. Um, so Sherry, thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for having me, Marissa. All right. Well, first and foremost, Sherry, I'd love to just hear a little bit more about your journey. What led you to supporting women with emotional eating? Because I know it's something that a lot of us often struggle with, but we don't necessarily talk about it. Yeah, this is such a long story that I'm going to do my best to shorten and really my journey started when I got into the health and fitness space and I actually stumbled upon it by accident as I call and the way that I got into health and fitness was really to help overcome a major back injury when I was a teenager I was struck by a car and I damaged my spine and I went on to have my first back surgery by the time I turned 17 years old and during that time I was in varsity sports and I was involved in basically any sort of activity that I can compete in and usually coming out of it with an MVP or maybe even first or second place. And so I always identified myself as this athlete and tomboy and, and super competitive just in general nature. And so after the car accident and after I had my first back surgery, I was told that I was never allowed to play sports again. And I listened to this advice for years and only found myself actually engaging in a very different environment in a very different social environment where Generally, our parents tell us not to do these habits, but I found myself doing them and they didn't align with who I was. And so I kind of woke up one day, Marissa, just unable to recognize myself. Who is this person? Like, what have I become? I can't even believe some of the things that I'm doing. And I've always envisioned myself very active and really just using my physical body to do the things that I enjoy. And so it was at that moment that I actually decided to go back to the gym and to start to work on my body, even though it was against doctor's orders, I was told not to ever play sports again, and was actually resorting to daily pain medication to be able to manage my back pain. And even at that point, I was actually doing a master de master's degree in chemistry. And so this was a very foreign concept to me just to be in that gym space. And so I signed up at the local gym. I kept showing up day in, day out, stayed consistent. And what I found was after a few months, my back pain was almost gone. I was actually able to get off pain medication. I ended up buying a treadmill and I started running five minutes at a time until eventually I was able to run for a full hour outdoors. And then that just led really to this avalanche effect where I decided to drop out of my chemistry degree and go back to school and study everything I possibly could about the human body. And so I got into exercise science, started a, a, a brand new bachelor's degree. My parents were freaking out and then eventually went on to become a certified athletic therapist and become an osteopath. And then, of course, along this journey, I had to study nutrition because I needed to be able to support my clients with the right way to eat. And so even though initially my goal to even enter the space was to focus on overcoming major pain, and it wasn't focused on needing to release weight, I actually found myself becoming very, very confused about nutrition and about rules and about diets in general. And so when I first started the journey, it was calorie counting because that's what everybody was doing and you were supposed to count calories. And so I jumped on that bandwagon. And then all of a sudden I heard about low fat diets because fats were very bad for us. And so then I took out all fats for my diets. 
But then it got super confusing because this guy named Atkins was now saying fats are really, really good and carbs are very bad. And so I'm like, yes, okay, I'm behind that. And then I opened a CrossFit gym and then got into the paleo world. And since I heard we're supposed to be eating like a caveman, I started doing that. And then that became keto and then that became zone and then that became vegan diet. And it brought a lot of confusion. And so I started to notice that I was secretly struggling with this obsession with food and who actually called me out on this was my brother. It's like, Sherry, do you notice that you're always thinking about food? You're always talking about food. You're always thinking about what you're going to eat next. You're always talking about what you just ate. And it's this constant, constant dialogue in your mind. And I couldn't help but realize that he was right. And so what I had done because of all this confusion is I had created a lot of anxiety and fear and stress around food. I was very fearful to eat certain things or I was very doubtful to eat certain things. And a lot of my self value was actually placed on these foods that I ate, especially because I was a coach and I was supporting people with their health, either through treatment or through actual nutrition and movement. And so I started discovering that I was secretly struggling with a disordered relationship with food. And what that looked like, Marissa, was being super clean Monday to Friday being organized with my meal plan and following all the rules of that week, by the way. And then on the weekends, that's where I noticed that I now was tending to drive to another grocery store far away from my gym, making sure my members would not see me to purchase all the snack foods that we don't eat because they're not good for us. And then finding myself feeling so out of control around these foods. And so on my journey to try to gain control over my relationship with food and my behavior, it started to dawn on me those who are struggling with their weight the longest, those who have tried almost everything under the sun, they haven't failed because they're not trying hard enough. It's not because they don't want it bad enough. It's not because they're not disciplined or motivated enough. It's really because they've actually triggered their nervous system to be completely fearful around food. And so what we find actually is there's this entrapment when we are in what I call protection mode, that's a nervous system state that oftentimes we refer to as fight or flight or sympathetic nervous state, but there's this entrapment of thoughts and emotions and actions and behaviors that are very much associated with a lot of self, um, almost self unworthiness, I wanna say. I always wanna to come to that word of not enoughness. And so when we understand that that's the pattern that's actually driving the behavior and we can learn to create awareness around it, almost observing it as a movie that's playing, that's where we can start to interrupt that pattern. Wow. So many things stood out to me as you were saying that story. Uh, when I was getting ready to get married, as many brides to be, I definitely got into a phase where I was started becoming obsessed with what I ate because I wanted to look perfect for my big day. And I was working out super hardcore. And I remember I'd go to this cardio kickboxing class and this woman there, a mom, mom of like two or three kids, she had like super cut abs, okay? And I was so impressed because mm -hmm. I did not have that. And I was working so damn hard and eating very little. And I remember one day, I'm like, what do you do to get those abs? And she looked at me and she said, I don't work out any harder than you do. This is right. genetics. <laughs> and it was such an eye awakening moment for me that like, I had to just be okay with the fact that I was doing everything I could do and probably more than I should have been doing, as you're saying, I was probably totally messing up my nervous system at that time and needed to get this vision out of my head of what I was necessarily striving for in a way. Does that sound familiar? Like things your clients are coming to you for sometimes? Yeah, absolutely. And, and most of us in general, we have this, the way that we set up our goals, we have this image that our happiness or our joy or our success is on the other side of that. And so we assume that if I release 20 pounds, then I'll be a happier person and I'll actually love myself. Or we assume when I finally make a million dollars, then I'll be successful. And again, I will love myself. And so we see the same thing also around health and fitness. And what I want to come back to around your story is just this idea, this concept of epigenetics. And I'm sure I'm sure you're familiar with it, that our thoughts actually create chemistry in the body. 
So this is where the mismatch is when it comes to transformation, because it's not what we're doing that creates transformation. It's actually who we're being. It's how we're showing up. It's it's the collection of all the thoughts and the emotions that are actually driving that transformation. And so I used to see this all the time when I did own a gym where people would come in, they would change their nutrition completely. They would change their training. Now they're training four or five days a week. Everything has changed in their lifestyle. But the one thing that has not changed is their self-concept. It's their identity. It is their self-belief. And so even though they're doing all the things, the way that they're actually being is, this is not going to work for me. Nothing ever works for me. I'm, I am this, I'm that, and I don't want to go on. And, and I'm very mindful, by the way, when how I use the word I am. So I have a hard time actually repeating some of the things I hear. But these, this is the internal dialogue that's constantly running in our mind, the not enoughness, the constant lack that we're focusing on, the constant scarcity that we're focusing on, feeling that our joy, our success, all those emotions that we actually want from what it is that we're trying to experience is only going to happen later once we achieve that thing. But coming back to that comment about the six pack, if we truly believe that we can't have a six pack, then that becomes our truth. And if we truly believe that no matter how much we try something or how hard we're working, that it's never going to work for us, then that also becomes our belief. And so I also actually get asked that question a lot. How did you get your six pack, Sherry? And I'm going to tell you, Marissa, I never once had an intention to have a six pack, but I did have an intention and I still do. And this is the reason why I continue to stay consistent in my training is because I want to be autonomous. I don't want anyone to help me do anything. I want to be completely independent. There used to be a time in my life where I needed someone to bring me to the washroom. I needed someone to help me bathe. And so that's always been my ultimate goal. I want to have strength and stability in my body. I want to be pain free and I want to be able to do that up until the day that I die. And so as dramatic as that sounds, because that's always been my intention, the reason that I show up has nothing to do with having joy on the other side of it. It's always focused on what I can do in that 24 hour period, allowing for flexibility, allowing for adaptability, really focusing on what do I have to do to become the person who is strong, who's pain free, who's resilient and who's independent versus what do I have to do to get a six pack? What do I have to do to release X number of pounds? Because when we set up our goals, really outcome focused, which is what we tend to do, because that's what we're told we're supposed to do. And that's what we're, we are promised so much when we do achieve those goals. But when we focus on outcome focused goals, what ends up happening is the moment we achieve that goal, well, we stop working or we actually end up showing up for ourselves without a practice of generosity meaning we're eating a salad because there's an exchange we're expecting. We're exercising because there's an exchange and that exchange is the results that we want. We're not actually being generous with ourselves. When we're being generous, we're just giving ourselves this gift without expecting anything in return. And so what we could do instead, and this is what I always see, the one key, the one element to harness success is to focus on how can I create a system? Instead of having an outcome focused goal, I'm going to have a system focused goal. Instead of focusing on what do I have to do to release 30 pounds, I'm gonna focus on who do I have to become to be the person who's 30 pounds lighter? And now those habits I can start to implement into my day-to-day -day life, and now I can start to manage all the other things that begin to interfere with that, which is the trauma of the past, the emotional dysregulation that I'm currently in, focusing on how to always shift my nervous system so that I am constantly aligning my body with all the things that I am doing to match the results that I am moving towards. Love that. Yeah. And I'm in total agreement. And I just want to add, okay. And by the way, your abs are fire. I saw that <laughs> photo before. Um, I made it a goal recently. I'm hitting up a milestone birthday this year. And I made it a goal that I really want to be in the best shape of my life. I want to feel the healthiest. I want to really embrace, like, I've definitely gone through like the, the mountaintops, the peaks and the valleys with my workout routines up and down. And I just want to maintain more of like that lifestyle. Right. So I, I really, um, I started this a few months ago and I started doing more Pilates, which is something I've never done. And girlfriend, let me just tell you, I don't have a six pack, but damn, I got some definition in this. <laughs> yeah, keep going. Yeah, um, yeah. All right. Well, let's talk about what we're here to talk about today, which is emotional eating. So how can women, in your opinion, like differentiate between true hunger and emotional hunger? Oh, so good. 
So emotional hunger is a type of hunger that we're going to start to notice comes about when it's triggered from the environment. So something happened outside of me, or maybe something happened that triggered a memory that I had from the past that suddenly changed my state. And it's emotional hunger when all of a sudden that need for food became so sudden and so intense. So we could have been at normal baseline and then all of a sudden I need food and I need it now. And the other thing that we notice too when we have emotional hunger is that the craving is very specific. So we know exactly what we want. It's gonna be chocolate. It's likely going to be foods that will give us an immediate source of energy because that's what the body's trying to do is trying to access energy now. And most of the time that comes from refined foods and processed foods. And again, it's very, very specific. So we know exactly what it is that we want. Whereas when we have actual hunger, what we'll notice is that it's been maybe quite some time since we ate last, or when we finished our last meal, maybe we weren't completely satisfied and full. And when we start to actually experience real hunger, we experience it in the body instead of the mind. So emotional hunger is more of a mind hunger, whereas body hunger, you're gonna actually start to feel the signs, start to feel your stomach rumbling. You might get lightheaded, you might get the shakes, kind of depending on what you do to display hunger. And what you'll notice too is that as you allow these hunger cues to continue to grow, they just begin to intensify and intensify. So when we're hungry, we feel it and then it kind of goes away. But then when it comes back, it's even more, more intense and then it goes away and then it comes back and it's even more intense. So we see that it intensifies over time. And when we have real hunger, what we're actually craving is real food. We're actually craving food and just about anything will satisfy it. We're okay with sushi. We're okay with a salad. We're okay with certain types of food. We're very open to different ideas. Whereas when we have emotional hunger, it's very, very specific and it's very intense. And so those are ways that we can start to really distinguish between the two. But the one thing that I want you to create awareness around, if you're listening to this and curious around how to distinguish between both of them is what triggered you to hunger. Was it the fact that you haven't eaten in a while or was it the fact that you got some bad news or you just finished hanging out with somebody who maybe always makes you feel a certain way. So begin to actually notice what your environmental factors are and how then all of a sudden this need for food becomes so intense and becomes so urgent and very, very specific. Totally. That makes me think like maybe you're not super hungry, but then you go out and you meet up with someone and they're you're in a restaurant and like you're in an environment that triggers you all of a sudden now to want to order something specific on the menu, right? Like that could be an emotional hunger cue. Because I think we often think about like, you know, the bad news or something triggering that like negatively, but it could also be something positive. Like you're socially meeting up with someone and you're not hungry or you didn't think you were hungry, but now all of a sudden you feel hungry. Right. Yeah. And, and not to add so many labels. And, and so we could look at that as maybe compulsive overeating. And so you just ate and maybe because you're feeling good and food, by the way, is a massive connector with others. So we connect over food with when there's happy moments and when we're celebrating and then we connect over food as well when we're mourning a loss of somebody. And so sometimes it's also just habituated. And so you'll notice that when you're with certain people, you'll tend to behave a certain way. It could also be habituated in the evening. Maybe you have an association with TV, 8 p.m., couch and snacks, which a lot of people have. And so the goal again is not to identify ourselves into a particular box and say, oh, this is my behavior. It's really just to begin to create awareness around, okay, what is the trigger? The trigger could be a food. The trigger could actually be the fact that every time I eat sugar or every time I have a cookie or a dessert, all of a sudden I feel out of control. If I eat other foods, then I'm okay. And so you'll have to start to identify that. And what's really important to state too is that there's no set rules. It's really a practice of self-discovery. It's a practice of understanding how you've linked food with some of the things that you're feeling because on a very primitive level, food for us equals safety. And this is what the nervous system offers us. And so anytime we're feeling unsafe in the environment and we trigger protection mode or we tr trigger that sympathetic nervous response, what we're also triggering is that natural inclination to survive. And that means preparing for a famine. And when we prepare for a famine, the body does a couple things. First, it slows down our metabolism and it makes sure that it's not going to just waste any energy. So it's gonna conserve energy. 
and the energy that it's trying to conserve is our fat stores. Actually, fat, it, t fat tissue itself is very, very precious to the body. It'll be the last tissue that it gives up. In fact, our body will give up lean body mass, muscle tissue, before it gives up our fat tissue because we need fat for so many important and valuable functions in the body. And so the body slows down the metabolism and then it increases cravings, again, for those, those foods that we were referring to, foods that can offer immediate energy. And so when we tend to have those food available, what we'll also notice is that we have a binge response. And this again is actually a natural mechanism we feel that binging is something wrong with us, but it's not actually something wrong with us. We all have the capacity to binge because we all have to be able to prepare for a famine. And should there be an access to food, we have to be able to feast, meaning we have to be able to eat without limits. And so the moment we trigger this part of the nervous system, and then we start to fight it by restricting more and dieting and then shaming ourselves and disappointing ourselves and feeling frustrated over it, the more we trap ourselves in that cycle, not knowing that all we're doing is just re-triggering that pattern and really making it even more challenging for us to interrupt it. And so again, as I share all these things, what's really important is taking that step back with a non-judgmental stance and just observing what's going on and not trying to get information from an outside source, but really just tuning in to your own higher self, that place of awareness that can really explain to you there's this particular emotion that you always feel. You felt it likely at a particular time in your life where you needed to shut it down, where you weren't able to cope with it. And so you did a great job creating a coping mechanism. But now that coping mechanism, it's harming us. It's no longer serving us. So now let's get curious around that. What can I do to maybe pay attention to that emotion, to really address that experience that I had and allow it to pass through me so that I can become more emotionally regulated? And do you feel like the best way to do that is to be keeping some sort of food journal or diary to be able to document this? Because I think we can notice that awareness a lot in the moment, but then the brain gets cluttered with so many other things that we may not remember it as an important memory down the mm -hmm. line. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that is actually a very powerful tool. However, what's really important is the intention behind that tool. A lot of us associate a food diary or a journal with counting calories or judging ourselves for how much we ate. And so now the intention must be different. And this can become one of your most powerful tools of awareness, again, if you approach it with a sense of curiosity. So as I begin a food journal, my goal is not to judge myself for how much I'm eating or what I'm eating. My goal is just to start to link certain experiences, certain emotions with my behavior. And then maybe even introduce that hunger scale that we were talking about. And so that hunger scale allows us to really understand what's going on in the body, really tune into our body's appetite control mechanism. And so I have a hunger scale that I introduced that I also use with my clients. And we have a zero, which is our baseline. That's neutral. That's I'm not hungry. I'm, I'm not full. I'm just I'm kind of just hovering and not really thinking about food. And then our minus 10 is our hunger level. So minus 10 is I am so hungry, I'm gonna kill someone, I'm so, I better get food yesterday. And then the plus 10 is I'm so full, I need to unbutton my pants, I cannot even breathe. And so what you'll notice actually is that if you start to keep this journal and then start to become aware of where you are on that hunger scale when you had that meal, you can now start to manipulate where, where and when the best time to eat is. So I tend to notice for me that if I eat when I'm at a hunger of minus eight, minus nine, minus 10, I will likely overeat. And I actually will likely have a hard time finding satisfaction because I've just been so hungry for so long. And if I tend to eat where I'm a plus nine or plus 10, I feel miserable. I feel so heavy in my body. I, I feel lethargic. I don't really feel like doing much. And so similarly, if I eat up until I'm maybe a plus three on the hunger scale, I'm going to have cravings later. I'm still going to want to seek out food. And so this can, again, be a very powerful tool for awareness. But if you want to really interrupt this pattern, you cannot approach it with judgment. The more you judge, the more that voice in the head is constantly telling you that what you're doing is not enough and constantly shaming you through this, the more you're locked into the cycle. And so it really does require compassion and self-love and curiosity. Love that. Thank you so much. All right. Let's talk about hormones now and how they play a part in our potential emotional eating. So good. So I'm actually going to talk about two hormones. 
There's actually many hormones that we can talk about, but we would need a good four or five hours, Marissa, and I know we're short on time. But what's super interesting around addressing hormones really is that it's not just gonna be through the foods that we consume. It's really gonna be through managing our nervous system state, as well as making sure that we're getting restful sleep. And so the hormones that I actually want to discuss is first and foremost, cortisol, which we don't oftentimes think about is helping us to increase weight or helping us rather to conserve energy because that's really what's happening on that primitive level. And so when we stimulate protection mode, fight or flight or sympathetic response, that is the hormone that's released alongside with adrenaline. And adrenaline helps us really get that superpower feeling where we're suddenly feeling like we could take on the world, we're ready to charge. So it helps us take action. But cortisol helps us access energy quickly. And that's also what's responsible for all those sugar cravings. And so when we don't manage our stress, AKA our nervous system, when we're not constantly tuning in, checking in where we are, then that could end up becoming an issue. Now, I also wanna say that cortisol is not a bad hormone. We're not trying to demonize it. Thank goodness for cortisol because it's doing its job and it's helping us survive. It does though become an issue where now it's chronic. Now I'm constantly, constantly in a form of stress. I finished tax season, then right away I launched a project, then right away I signed up for a race, and then right away my mother was in the hospital, then right away, and so it's like boom, 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 one after the other, and we never gave ourselves an opportunity to come back down to center. And so that's an important hormone to manage and also relies on restful sleep. Now, restful sleep is also really important because when we get restful sleep, which is very different than getting a certain number of hours of sleep, so we could get eight hours of sleep, but still wake up unrested due to different reasons. But when we get restful sleep, we're now able to balance all these hormones. And more importantly, we're able to balance our circadian rhythm, which also is now impacting all of our other hormones, including growth hormone, including insulin and cortisol. Cortisol is generally high in the morning naturally. Insulin is more low in the evening. So we have insulin resistance in the evening. But when we're able to match our bodies and our sleep cycle with a circadian rhythm, we're now able to actually balance all the other hormones. And so two hormones that are important to talk about, these are the appetite control hormones, are ghrelin and leptin. And ghrelin and leptin, are hormones that tell us that we should eat. So they're released when there's hunger. So ghrelin is released from the stomach when we're hungry. Leptin tells us we're full and we're satisfied and that's released from the fat cells. When we don't get restful sleep, now we're disrupting those hormones. So you'll notice that if it's been a few days, you're not sleeping well, maybe you're a new parent. And by the way, this is such a temporary phase. It's going to be over soon. Just give yourself grace and get through it. You're doing an amazing job but just give yourself that opportunity to rest if you can. And you'll notice that if you've had several days with disrupted sleep, you'll have more cravings the next day. Notice what happens in the middle of the afternoon. You have sugar cravings, you're feeling like you're constantly mindlessly eating, you're not feeling satisfied with what you ate. And so we, again, we always turn to food to correct our behavior. The food is the side effect of what's going on. But if we address actually our health, then we can transform our entire bodies. And we're told in society that if we wanna release weight, then well, we have to start cutting calories. And if we wanna be healthy, then we have to release that weight. But it's actually the other way around. If we want to release weight, we actually have to be healthy first. And that really is about focusing on our in, internal environment, our, on our inner environment, because our physical body is a direct reflection of whatever is going on inside. Again, it's not what's happening with the outside world. It's not the exercise, it's not the food that we're eating. It's really what's going on inside because that is impacting hormones. That's impacting the production of certain chemical reactions of the body. And more importantly, it's driving our behavior. So true. I feel like oftentimes we're just putting a Band-Aid on something, but we're not getting to the root cause. So I love that you said that. All right, final question before we move on to our lightning round here. What is one small step that you would advise our listeners to take today when it comes to managing the hormones, the emotional eating, if they just really wanna take one small action step into, into getting started here? The simplest and the most challenging though thing to do, I would say is to harness self-compassion and self-love. If we're able to do that, just that one thing, it's gonna change how we show up for ourselves. It's gonna change even why we wanna show up for ourselves. We cannot shame or guilt our way to transformation. We can only love ourselves through that. And so if you're able to start a daily practice of maybe standing in the mirror and complimenting yourself, just honoring your body for all that it's done for you up until this moment, if it's given you babies, 
if it's helped you walk, if it's helped you observe and experience the world in the way that you want with such freedom, then that is a great place to start. And that will also start with gratitude and appreciation. I love that tip so much because it is such a simple thing to do, but it is not always easy for people mm. to do it. And I want to recognize that that may feel awkward for you. That might feel weird. You might be one of those people that deflects compliments anytime you get them. You might have a hard time looking in the mirror and finding something to compliment yourself on. But it is something really simple. Again, not easy, but really simple that you can start doing for yourself. It takes, what, 10 seconds a day? And it's a great place to start. So thank you for sharing that, Sherry. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I love what you said too, the, the deflection. And this is a really important one. We never sit in that receivership of beautiful things that people say to us. Yet we hang on to the mean things. We hang out to, we hang we on sure to the nasty do. things, right? <laughs> and so just being in that place of receivership and just responding back, getting to the habit of responding back with, I receive. Not feeling like I need to give a compliment back. Not feeling like I need to maybe change the topic but just actually sitting in that receivership. That is so powerful. Yes, agree. All right, Sherry, well, we're gonna move on to a quick lightning round now where I'm just gonna ask you some random questions just so we can get to know you a little bit more personally. Are you ready? I think so. Okay, well, ready or not, here we go. What <laughs> would you say is your guilty pleasure TV show? My guilty pleasure TV show. I just finished watching this movie called Messiah uh, or it's a show on Netflix called Messiah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Let's see. If you could only pick one of the following places to visit for the rest of your life, which one would it be? It's a nail salon, a hair salon, or a spa? Hair salon. Nice. For obvious yeah. reasons. <laughs> <laughs> if they made a movie about your life, who would you want to play you? Ooh. Hmm. What is the name of that lady who was Wonder Woman? That actress yeah, who is know. Wonder Woman. I think she's okay. an Israeli actress. I'm going to find her name, but it's her, Marissa. It's her. <laughs> it's her. It's her. Okay. Now we're all curious. We're all going to go Google it. Uh, if you could have any superpower, what would it be? I think it's a fly. I would want to fly. Yeah. Top answer on the show. All right. Finally, Sherry, I'm very curious since you're so into fitness and motivation, what is your go to like get it done song um these days i'm going to say um hmm probably eminem i would say these days he's he's doing something for me these days um so probably rap god i would say is the song of the day <laughs> all right yeah love it all right sherry well tell our listeners where they can find you before we officially wrap up yeah, absolutely. So if you want to get in touch with me, send me a message, ask questions, you can find me at Sherry Shaban Fitness on Instagram. And if you've liked this conversation and you notice that you're struggling with emotional eating or any other unwanted eating behavior, I have a free download for you at makepeacewithfood.com where you can start your journey to healing your relationship with food. Thank you so much. And we'll be sure to link that in today's show notes. Sherry, thank you so much for being on the show, for sharing all this important information and all of your expertise with us. We appreciate it. Thank you so much, Marissa. And I really wish when I was a young mom that I had a show like this to come to, to really feel connected with what you're doing. And thank you so much for allowing so many people to listen to your voice and to have such amazing guests on the show and really create this impact that you are. Appreciate you. Thank you.